Welcome back everyone to episode 6 of our tutorial series on Advanced Tactics Gold. We're going to push on to the next turn. In this episode I want to cover both Engineers, which I think we have gotten a few of now, and I want to try to get to Interceptors and Dive Bombers as well. But this may require us to actually push through a few in-game rounds, so we'll try to do this very quickly. At this point I hope that you already know how to do the movement, how to do the transfers, and also how to switch the HQ of various units. I think we will start off actually by, we'll still pretend to half-heartedly play this campaign out. Um, so what we'll do is, I notice there is an advantage we can um, push. We can surround this infantry units from four sides, which should give us enough of a numerical superiority and um, open up the flanks enough that we can get a, a really solid attack on this unit. So we're gonna do that. But to start with, I'm actually gonna switch the headquarters for these two frontline units over to the frontline headquarters. This unit can't move very far, which is product of the flak, which is moving the whole unit our artillery rate, and also that the riflemen we moved in last turn, you can see that their readiness is only up to 55 from, I think it was 25, so their action points have been reduced to only 77 instead of 100. Now it's kind of strange, but this unit will move at the artillery rate every one of the individual units in it will take off the action points for moving one space at the artillery rate. So although riflemen by themselves move only like 30 into this territory, these riflemen will lose 60 action points, which happens to be the penalty for a flak to move in here. And that's again just reinforcing this point that a division will move completely at the rate of its slowest unit. So the riflemen don't get to move any faster because they're waiting for the flak. Don't think of it in terms of like, individual units moving, but your whole formation is moving and it'll take a long time to move there. Okay, so we switched these two over. Now let's try to take advantage of this attack. Um, I probably should showcase this as well. I'm gonna move this unit up. It potentially can attack, but I'm just gonna move it back right afterwards because it's not going to attack. For some reason, um, if I do all, it'll get all four of ours are all five of our units into the attack. But, okay, now it's working. I see, I see. So originally I had this unit still under the red headquarters um, on a separate attempt to record this video, but I had no audio because I just moved and I'm, I, basically it's my own mistake. I was stupid, I didn't set up my audio correctly. Um, if this unit was belonging to another headquarters, this attack would lose its concentric bonus, its ability to coordinate, I guess, because it had two different headquarter units attacking, which is interesting. So if you're doing an attack with more than one HQ, I guess it's possible for it to suffer a bit of a penalty. However, in this case, now we're going 20 over the attack stack. Is it useful for us to gain that extra? We It does penalize us a bit. At the same time, it does bring more units to bear, and although they're only fighting at 50 readiness, um, maybe uh, as soon as we lose any amount of units, which adds up to 20 of attack stack, as soon as we lose 20 units of attack stack during the combat rounds, the penalty for the attack stack immediately decreases. So this is a real time updated thing. Um, at least I was led to believe that. And I trust that that's true. So that means that if you're at like 220 out of 200, as your units start taking casualties, you'll, your attack stack drops below 200 and you lose any of the penalties associated with being overstacked. Uh, you, I mean, in a morbid way, you can think of this as the units dying, allows other units to spread out a little further. So I'm not sure what's the best thing to do. I think the added firepower is worth it at this point because we do expect to still take quite a few casualties. This unit has been here. Um, its readiness is almost perfect. It has a bit of entrenchment because it's in what well, we can't see, but if I hit escape or just back out this way, that this is a field terrain which gives them decent entrenchment, 43. I'd say for fun, let's go ahead and attack. The problem is I wanted this unit to move back up here because I want to hold this area right here. So I can move this unit here. You can see these armor don't have the ability to even assist with this attack, otherwise I would consider doing that. Let's also continue moving this infantry down the road. And we will switch this guy over as well. I think we'll just move him here for now and switch his headquarters. 
he's basically blocking the road so that no armored counterattack can plow through us and onto Odessa. Okay, so our lines are all kind of set, but let's do this attack from multiple sides. And let's see how it goes. So each round, now we've probably already lost the attack stack penalty. And voila, we won. Now, we did take quite a few casualties in this. Let's see exactly how the attack went. So the attacker, us, we lost 27 German riflemen, 5 machine guns. And I would say that's probably comparable. Yeah, it says slightly we've lost slightly more power points than they have. And I, I, I tend to agree that this was... I mean, this is the way attacking goes. You do suffer losses. But in order to gain the advantage of the territory, you usually say it's worth it. So we lost 42 power points. The most of their power points came from AT guns and horses, which is really nice to inflict casualties on those. Basically, we lost five machine gun, which are relatively cheap units, and 27 riflemen, which are the cheapest. They lost 13 riflemen cheap machine guns, but mortars are twice as expensive even as machine gun. And horses are also as expensive as machine guns. AT guns are, you know, about 1,000 production points each, so they're worth about 10 riflemen. So you kind of do the math in production points. That's the way I typically do it. Um, we come out about even. Importantly, they will retreat with much lower readiness than what, that which they initially had. So this makes them vulnerable to a follow-up attack. And this is kind of where defense in depth can be important. Um, so you might consider keeping maybe two infantry divisions on the front, but maybe one behind just in case to prevent a follow-up attack if those initial units are pushed back. So that, that looks, that's what a successful attack looks like from multiple sides. You can see even though we had really over, overwhelming numbers, it was, you know, about, let's just call it four and a half to one odds, and that was barely enough to give us a solid victory here. So just be warned that without, with even less odds, you might not be successful. And that's the huge advantage of defending in this game. So usually even defending a, a hex at full attack stack. So this one's 39, this one's 34. Here we have one that's 104. Usually even defending with this kind of attack stack makes the hex very difficult to um, overwhelm unless you're attacking from at least three sides. And typically you'll need artillery bombardment to soften the unit up first. So I think this game has a little favoritism towards defense a little bit more. I think I've already mentioned that, but it kind of reminds me a little bit of the World War I style of defense, of um, uh, strategy, where you can kind of entrench your forces along the front and just slowly move up. Now this does also bring in some of the World War II tactics like Schwerpunkt. So if you're able to break through the line in one area and they don't have um, good enough defense in depth, it's really important that you push through and try to, every hex you can see that we pushed through this hex and that allowed us to get a better surround on another unit. Now, if we had, if their line was here, us pushing through this hex allows us potentially a three-sided attack on Kiev or Kiev. Um, I actually don't, I think that both pronunciations are okay. Um, I suppose, from what I've heard, Ukrainians pronounce it one way and Russians pronounce it another, and I'm not really gonna try to tangle with that <laughs> mess, so. We'll just keep saying it any way we want, and everyone knows what I'm talking about anyway, which is the point of language and communication, just to convey a concept or an idea. So even if I don't say it correctly, I am still communicating effectively. Okay, so let's go on to the blue. These guys are certainly supposed to move up to our northern front, the first army. We can also do a few transfers. Again, I want to get to engineering and interceptors on this turn, even if we stop playing effectively with transfers and all that. I might sacrifice our actual combat effectiveness because this is a tutorial and not a full let's play. That's why we're playing both sides so that we can make mistakes or just do really inefficient things and not lose outright. So let's actually grab these engineer first. Engineers are good for many things. They can build any of these roads that we see. They can upgrade the resources we see. So we can, this one's already oil level two. Down here we have a raw, I think this is level two. Over here, we have a raw level two. It looks like all of our resources are currently up at level two. Um, do we have another oil facility? We do over here. And this one's also oil level two. So if I zoom out once, let's just take a, the, take a glance at the big picture. We have two raw production, 
and we have two oil production. Well, if we look up in our resources, the oil itself isn't doing so badly. So, I mean, I would say 2000 is not a whole lot and that our armor is gonna very quickly run out of steam. However, we can see already that the raws are having a big problem. The way I've already, I think I've already mentioned this, but just in case I'll mention it again, the way raws work is that when you finish your turn, the raws needed to build all the different things that we're currently producing, including, well, none of these units cost any raw materials, which you can see on the portrait here, because I think I didn't mention that before. So machine gun, we see this cause this costs one raw, and we're making four of those, so that counts for four of this 256 that we're spending. The trains here cost 20 raw, so that's another 160 raws. Well, the good thing is we can drop these down. We don't need those anymore, so that's going to help us, but... I just wanted to say that the way this mechanic works is the raws you need to build these various things are taken before you get the um, bonus from the resources. So it works in this method. Build is first taken, and if you don't have enough, which this red is indicating that not only is there a negative amount, which would normally appear, appear in yellow, but the red indicates that it's actually exceeding our current stockpile, which means we won't be able to build everything that we currently plan to build. So with that being said, we should also, we should definitely decrease our production, but we are, we've already seen that the railroads, I mean, the trains are costing a lot and we're going to decrease those. However, we also want to build some more aircraft and those are going to increase the cost of raw. Okay. So bottom line is we need to increase our raw. There is a very poor way of doing that. You can always dedicate a city's production and this works. There's a very few things that a captured city can do, but this is one of the few things. It only has access to produce political points or resources. I think, I can't remember if it produces supply or not. No, I think it only produces political points, resources, and I can't remember if that's it. That might be it. So anyways, political points or resources are, I think the two, I'm sure the two things that you can do with occupied cities which is any city which is of a different person type, people type. This one's Russian, but we are the Germans. So if we were to capture any of these cities, like we might do with Kiev, uh, we can't use it for just anything. We can't produce infantry out of it. It's only useful for a few things. All right, so that brings us full circle back to engineers. We need to upgrade our raw. However, level two to level three is actually a pretty substantial investment, not just of political power, but of engineering points. Um, it doesn't showcase the engineering points here, but let's just go ahead and create a new division. And let's make this subordinate directly to our Supreme Headquarters, because this is not going to be a combat unit, it's going to be engineering. And let's just put 20 engineers into there. Okay, so now this 20 engineers, instead of showing their action points here, it'll still show it here, but it'll show our engineering points. So the engineering points just represents how much supply or whatever they have to actually construct different things. Now we want to eventually upgrade this raw material here to level three because yeah, we're having some raw material issues. So I'm gonna move this engineer down. Unfortunately, he's not gonna have enough engineering points to do it even next turn, I don't think, and our political point situation is not doing great either. So we'll probably have to make some changes to that. We're also going to get this second division created here with another bunch of engineers. And this one I'm going to get to just move one hex over here and build a factory. In fact, ultimately, what I wanted to showcase is that we can build a road over to Kohlberg. Not necessary, I'm just doing it for demonstration purposes. If you have a road already established, especially crossing the river and everything, I recommend you don't build, unless you have an abundance of raws, don't build an additional road. Most of the road networks you're gonna want are gonna be towards the front. Now this one has the advantage of decreasing the uh, amount of um, land capacity that we're gonna need to use, I'm sorry, rail capacity we're gonna need to use in order to resupply the units in the north. But that's a really minor benefit compared to all the cost in raw, especially when we're so low. However, just to demonstrate, I'm gonna build a road with this unit. So. This is the R key, or you can just select this icon here. When you click it, it grays out the two, uh, well, in our case, the two hexes, but any of the hexes which are available to build a road. 
Obviously, we can't build a road in any of the other hexes because a road already exists there. So we, you know, it doesn't even give us the option. However, these two over here are available. You can see down here in the information bar that the road cost is 20 engineering points and it'll cost 20 raws. It'll also take our engineer 20, or sorry, 30 action points to move into the hex. That's just its normal movement cost. So let's build a road here. I'll click. And now we have to confirm the placement here, which we'll do. And now that engineer has built a road from that hex, our original hex, into the hex which we selected. Very good. Now, what we can see is that I could build a new location here. It doesn't take very many political points to do a lot of the things. What I wanted to build here was a factory. Unfortunately, this is one of the more expensive things in terms of political points. That and upgrading your, raw, your resources also cost quite a few political points. Now, I don't know what, the, again, I don't really know how to describe the abstraction of the political points in this situation, but, <clears throat> excuse me, you can just think of it as maybe like the, um, uh, the people who are proficient enough in building factories or whatever, we need to draw them away from potential officer or research positions. So they are going to go oversee our factories instead. Now, we don't have the political points to do it on this turn. We will next turn. Unfortunately, we're also playing a dangerous game with sacrificing political points we should use for our raw increase. So on this turn, we'll just increase our political points quite a bit. Um, as far as building a factory, I don't know which of these three I will build. <clears throat> My normal in-game um, prioritization goes tank factory first. Uh, it, I mean, of course it depends on the map. If there's a lot of open space, tank factories are more important. If it's a lot of forest, you may get some mm, marginal better benefit out of artillery. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because infantry is going to fight pretty well in the forest, but um, tanks won't. And artillery, although it doesn't work quite as well in the forest, it's still going to give you um, a bonus to the infantry where you, which you're attacking with. So probably I would say tanks and then gun. Aircraft factories are very important too. In fact, um, the AI tends to spam these uh, and it gets a little absurd. So uh, I, I kind of like playing with um, in-game rules that only one factory of each type is allowed. Although the game is supposed to be balanced such that the political point and engineering point cost is pro prohibitive enough that if you spend it on you know, the factory, you're losing off in some other aspect of the game. <clears throat> That's all just my two cents on the matter. So since we can't build anything, I'm just going to leave my engineer there. Now let's go over to the production menu, which I've been talking a lot about. Open our production overview. So we can see that we can't even build the necessary tanks, and this is because this is the thing which I guess has taken the hit. We also can't build the, engine, the machine guns we want. All these things because we don't have the raws. Now if I click this down to zero, we'll see that this three and zero, and now up to 16 and four. I don't know, I think it draws um, the negative raws. I think it looks at your production queue, which we have up here, and it draws them from the top first. It might just draw them not from the Supreme Command headquarters first. I don't know, but it takes them away from somewhere. Well, we don't need these trains. Let's go ahead and switch this over to political points because we're gonna need a whole bunch of those. I'm gonna drop down my rifleman down to 40 because it doesn't really matter to me. We'd rather get the political points just for demonstration, demonstrating various things. <clears throat> I actually want to do, let's just take a look at our supply. Our supply stockpile is going up very slowly. I think it was at 9,000 something on the previous turn. So it's very, very slowly rising, which means we're probably at the perfect amount of supplies because even though we're slightly better than what we're, um, we're making more than we're taking, we're also producing a lot more units, which are going to need more supply. So it's good to have a, a small surplus because that surplus will quickly fade into a deficit as you continue to produce units. All right, let's see here. So that's going to take care of our raw supply issue. We should now be increasing in raws, which is good. We don't quite have as many political points as I want. And I was also trying to, okay, we can get rid of these engineers. But instead of those engineers, I think we're going to build aircraft. And this is going to take our RAWs back down. I just want to get some fighters on this side so that we can demonstrate intercepting um, an enemy. So that's OK. We're not going to lose that many RAWs. So this is sufficient because we, we don't need any more engineers anyway. 
Another thing which uh, we should be doing, in fact, I should have done before the assault here, is I should be increasing the staff of my frontline headquarters. This one's at 36%. We can see that this is causing the morale modifier up here to be only 26 and 13, but now watch what happens when I increase our staff over here. Let's just load them up with an additional 40, which is a whole bunch. And you can see the rail capacity is much higher now that we built eight more trains. So we'll transfer that. Now we're up to 49 and 22. So pretty much doubled our benefit by adding more staff. And since this is the frontline one, it's the priority. We'll add 10 more there. And I'll add 10 more here as well, because I think this one's also running low. Yeah, now it's at 82. This one's at 97, so that's good, because we are doing the majority of our attacks over here. And the defending units seem to be holding very well, even with the slightly reduced um, staff efficiency. All right, well, I think that's everything we wanted to do. Um, supply. I'm also going to talk about supply, although it's um, not going to be so relevant until the Germans manage to occupy this the Priviat Swamp or whatever. If I go to, I want to hit F5 because that's my instinct, but if we click on this, which is also F5, this is our supply layer. Now I've selected a hex and it's trying to draw supply from there. Better thing to do is to select our main headquarters and now we can draw supply from here. Now, if we want at any hex, we can right click and it'll show us how supply is being passed there. It's showing us the least action point path for our supply. Just off the top of my head, I think I remember that supply moves at one along roads. And when you get to 100 action points, so we can see down here, um, it's 12 AP out of 250. When you get to 101 action points, so everything with 100 action points or less is green supply. When you get to 100 to 100, 101 to 150, this is yellow supply, which means, as it's indicating here, we're going to take 25% supply penalty. What this means, how I abstract it at least, is it's far enough away that the supply units themselves have to consume some of the supply they're supposed to deliver. And you can abstract it any way you want. Now, we don't have any instances of red here. Oh, we have blue here. So if we were trying to get supply all the way down to the marshes over here, what we can see is it would move in green, it gets to 83 action points here, it jumps up to 118 action points here, and then, because this is marsh and not very friendly to advancing supply, it gets up to 153 action points here, which means it takes a 50% supply penalty. In other words, half the supply you're sending doesn't even get there. It's consumed by the supply carriers. Like I said, we don't have an instance of red, but red would be from 201 to 250. And that would mean 75% of your supply does not reach the target. Anything above 250 and supply is not even sent. It's just, uh, the unit is completely out of supply. If we wanna see what kind of effect the supply is having, well, once your unit starts losing its required supply, so this unit is still in supply. It still has rounds left. Once your unit doesn't get the amount that it needed, it'll start losing readiness down to a minimum of 10. So a unit, even a unit that's been out of supply for, let's say, 10 years, is still going to maintain readiness of 10. And that's just how supply works. That's just the minimum, which is only a tenth of its original fighting strength. But um, it's still at least able to fight somewhat. But also cut off units. The worst case scenario is that, you know, if you get a unit surrounded, if it has nowhere to go, it will be completely destroyed and then attack if we are able to completely surround it. Um, just being cut off from supply doesn't mean the unit will be completely eliminated, which if I was a game designer, I would add in as a, a thing that um, if you're completely cut off from an attack and you lose an attack, I mean, if you're completely cut off from supply and you lose an attack, it seems reasonable that there's no place for you to regroup. You can't resupply. So you'd probably just route and uh, disband entirely. But um, I think that's a mechanic I've seen in other games, but it's not in this game. So, so we didn't get to interceptors yet, but um, we're very close because if we go to the next turn, I think that's everything I wanted to do. I got my... Did I get my production sorted out finally? Yeah, we're doing okay. It would be nice if we could sacrifice 
<clears throat> a little bit more, even some like tanks for just a few more political points. I just want to get, okay, we need just a few more. I'm going to have to sacrifice all the tanks here so that I have, I need eight more political points now. Oh, this is already maxed out. I'm silly. Eight more. Okay, so we'll just drop this down to zero so that I have 160 political points, which I think should be enough to be able to upgrade my raw and to build a factory next turn. And we're still getting our four interceptors, which is good. So we'll hit next turn. This will bring us back to... Oh, we actually lost our artillery. That's right, the anti-tank um, unit in this one, one of them was destroyed and it only had one. And we lost two horses, so we're down from three to one. And you can see that even after the readiness increase, which happens at the beginning of your turn, this unit is still at only 65 readiness. Um, so now at, that's gonna call this episode to a close. We run a little bit long, just talking about engineering and talking about supply. So that's how you manage your supply, is you're supplied from whichever headquarters you are under. And your, your headquarters is allowed to supply you, assuming it is supplied by your Supreme Command. So if I hit F5, which is a supply shortcut, we can see the same thing with the Russians. They don't have any places with yellow. And because they have roads running all the way down here, they're able to supply all these things within 100. They don't have good supply over here in the forest and the mountains, but everything towards the front is covered. So we're looking good. This is not a map which is really treacherous for supply. There's a lot of roads running around. I like to play with um, limited roads to start, which means that there are areas which are out of supply. I think it adds a little bit of complexity. However, next turn, next episode I should say, we will actually get to how to use air cover and air fire. Air, just everything related to the air. <laughs> the word I'm trying to, to air power. <laughs> That's the word I was trying to say. So anyways, until next episode, I hope you enjoyed this one. I hope it was a little bit helpful. And we'll cover air power in the next episode. My plan after that is to cover um, special unit designs because that was mentioned to me and I think it's a good idea. I can start showing you what my unit designs are. And I'll do that with the table of organization and equipment. But until then, thanks for watching and take care.